Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Are you taking hold of the things of God? Are you inheriting? Is God, his purpose, his plans for you? Are you taking hold of them, experiencing them, moving along God's purposes for why he saves you, why you are still here in this world? We're going to begin a new chapter tonight in our study of the book of Yahushua, the book of Joshua. And we're going to see how God moves in the life of the people in order to convey revelation and how so frequently the majority of individuals reject the revelation of God. So be wise, be humble, and do not reject God's revelation, but apply it to your life that you might be different and that you might inherit the things that God he wants you to have he is a good god a generous god a blessed god but it's only when you respond obediently submissively to his revelation then and only then are you going to take hold of these things that god desires that you partake of so look with me to the book of joshua and chapter 2 let's begin verse 1 we read and Yahushua bin Nun, which means Joshua, the son of Nun, he sent from Ha Shittim. Now, Shittim usually speaks about a type of wood. But because the definite article appears there, we're speaking about a proper, a specific location known as Shittim or Acacia. And therefore, it was at this location. Now realize that this term shittim, acacia, is also connected to the wood that the Ark of the Covenant was made from. And some of the commentators from a Hasidic position, they do not see this happening by chance. And I applaud them for realizing there is nothing by chance but everything by the providence of God, by what's called the hashgacha pratit, the providence of God upon his people. God orchestrates if we submit, if we respond to his revelation, he will orchestrate our life. He will move us to where he wants us to be. He will empower us and provide for us what we need to carry out his purposes. God, in other, way, in other words, wants to be actively involved in every, every, every aspect of, of our existence. That's what we need to glean from, from this text. Once again, verse 1. And Yehoshua, the son of Nun, he sent from Shittim two men, covert spies. Now, what we see here, and it could say he sent two men spies secretly why two well remember something moses he had sent forth 12 spies and he did so in order that they might bring about a confirmation of everything that god had said now what god had said his promise what they should expect they saw god was faithful but here's the problem. The people began to, all of it, no, 10 of the 12. Two, hear that, two were faithful. But two, but 10 were not. So Joshua, being one of the two, Ham and Kalev, what happens? Joshua, he sends forth just two, not 12. He doesn't want those 10, those 10 that were faithless, those 10 that focused upon the enemy 
and the power of the enemy. Realize, when we read this, and it's very significant how all of this is unfolding in God's inerrant, his perfect word, it says, Joshua, the son of Nun, he sent from Acacia two men, spies, secretly saying, go and see the land and Jericho. Now, notice that there is an emphasis upon the city of Jericho. We need to understand that as we go through the rest of this passage. Jericho, the oldest city, according to some, and a strongly fortified city. Now, some have pointed out it might have been wiser from a human perspective to go and can't conquer other places first. Leave Jericho for less. In fact, most armies would have done just that. They would have slaved weaker people and used them in order to increase their strength, not just their numbers, but all the ones that they conquered, include them into the children of Israel so that the children of Israel would be stronger to fight this, this stronghold, this fortress known as the city of Jericho. But God didn't do that. God said, you conquer Jericho first. If Jericho falls, obviously, all the rest of the land will be open unto you. So God didn't do this the way that logic, the way that man would think. God did it very differently. And Joshua was submitting to that. So he sent forth two men, not 12, two. He didn't want any influence from those 10 faithless ones that focuses upon circumstances rather than God. So we read, go and see the land and Jericho. They went and they came to the house of Isha Zona. Now, how do we understand that term, Isha Zona? Most will say, a harlot woman some will say a prostitute and that may very well be as more often than not the term zona means just that a harlot a prostitute but there is a different possibility because that word zona some of the commentators point out that it can also and perhaps better be understood as Zona in the connection to Mazon. Now, we could be talking about a similar root that has a different meaning. Mazon is nourishment. And perhaps the reason why the men went there is because she wasn't a prostitute, but she had a boarding house. That her house was a place of provision, a place of nourishment, a place of sustenance. And that's why they went there. Obviously, strangers, people would go to such a place and they wanted to go and see Jericho and to do it covertly, secretly. So again, go to the land and see it and Jericho. They went and they came to the house of, of this Isha Zona. Her name was Rechav. Now, Rechav means wide or broad now we're going to see something i've mentioned the term revelation as in god's supernatural revelation god giving truth to people wisdom knowledge instruction and rahav she is going to broaden her horizon she is going to be open to this revelation and she is going to respond to it very 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 differently than everyone else in jericho and not just in jericho but in all the land of canaan she is unique and therefore she is the one we don't know any of the other people's name in jericho it was a large well inhabited place a place of great security as i said a fortress but the only people that we know from this account is this woman so her name was Rachav, and it says they laid down there, meaning that they were going to rest there, and it can mean 
to spend the night. That was their intent. And what happened? Now move to the next verse, verse 2. And it was said to the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men, they have come towards here tonight the sons from the sons of israel to dig out this is an idiom to investigate or to search out the land now this is very significant because it shows us something yeshua he sent these two spies secretly covertly but nevertheless it was said to the king and this is what many scholars point out jericho was a mighty fortress because they had very good intelligence they knew what was going on all around them so the intent of these two spies come in quietly silently not causing anyone to take notice and go to perhaps a boarding house or go to a place where there was a prostitute the idea is that that men that were not so good they would go to that place and it would just be assumed this is why they're here this is what they're seeking regardless of how one would view that the king his intelligence he received information that there were spies that came to scout out the land to investigate it and they were at this woman's house look again it says in the next verse and the king of jericho sent and the implication is sent servants to rahav saying this is what the servant said you bring out the men the ones coming unto you which came to your house for to investigate all of the land they came now they know something we're going to see this in a moment the people of jericho obviously also the king knew that they were coming for the purpose of and hear this all the land not just jericho they had a much bigger objective they wanted to conquer all the land of canaan and even beyond the land of canaan and again this king he knew everything he knew two men had come he knew from where they had come and he knew their purpose it just wasn't about jericho it was beyond that and therefore we read in the same passage that the woman did something says for once again the end of verse three to investigate all the land they came now verse four the woman this is rachaf the woman took and this is what she had done she had taken the two men and she hid and pay attention it literally says and she hid him now your bible probably will say hid them and that's the intent but that's not what it says she hid both of them but literally only him why well when you study god's word you will find when you look at it in the original language there is frequently this this occurrence and there's a reason for it many times when you have a plural subject you will take and this is grammatically incorrect but it's not a mistake it's revelation god is communicating something you'll have with a plural subject you should have a plural verb but you'll have a singular one and what's the purpose for this to show unity these two men were not what you would expect normally when you have the number two in the scripture it speaks about a dichotomy two opposing views but here the word of god wants to say not in this situation this is an exception these two men they didn't have 
a, a contrary opinion one with the other. They weren't contradicting one another, but there were, they, they were one in purpose. They were under the purpose, the authority of God. They came for the same reason. So we read here in verse, verse 5, or actually verse 4, the woman took the two men and she hid him. And she said, thus, now she's speaking to the king's servants, thus, they came unto me, the men, but I did not know from where they came. Answer yourself, ask yourself a question. Is this true? You're going to find later on that she knows very well that they are from the children of Israel. Why? Because she too has received that same revelation of all the people within the land. It's very important that this fact is not set aside, ignored, but dealt with. She knew who they were and why they came and what was the purpose of the children of Israel. But you're going to see something. She changes this revelation impacted her ask yourself a question has the revelation of god changed you does it impact the way you think and who you are associated with for her it did this revelation was going to bring a very significant change to her and that change was going to be an eternal change that's what the revelation of god can do his truth so she's going to begin to do something and it's wise it is right that she does this now when this teaching is being recorded it is holocaust memorial day in israel and we know something there were many god-fearing righteous individuals that hid jewish people that saved jewish people's lives do you think that was a good thing? Do you think it was a right thing for them to do? And we know through, through testimony, sometimes the Nazis, they would come and they would say, are there any Jewish people being hid by you? Or do you know someone who is hiding Jewish people? Now, individuals said no, even though at times they were or they knew people who were. Do you think that was the right thing? Now, they didn't speak truth. They said something that was false and they knew it was false. Now, many times you might give information that's false, but you had no intent. You didn't know it was false. This is not the case here. In other words, they lied. And here's the lesson for us. Now, I realize there is going to be people that disagree with this, but I want you to know where I'm coming from. And that is, do not participate with the enemy do not assist the enemy and when the enemy wants information if that truth is going to harm if the supposition is if i share this they want that information to arrest to kill to to do something adverse to someone you're not called hear that you're not called to participate in that you can give false information to the enemy in order to, and hear this, in order to save a life. Now, I heard an individual, theologically, I'm very opposed to, to much of what he says. And he mentioned and gave a similar account and said that let God work it out, meaning he's saying at times you should always, always, always say the truth and if that endangers someone, if God doesn't want them in danger, let him get involved. Now, there's a principle, and I think it's a good one in Judaism, which is don't rely upon a miracle. Don't do something that the only way that that person is going to, to be saved, to be kept alive, that's not going to go through a, a catastrophe, is if God should miraculously intervene. Don't do something that requires God to miraculously intervene when you can simply by yourself do something to alleviate this this from happening we're not called to participate 
in the evil plans of the enemy. It was right that Rahav did not tell them the truth. What did she say? Well, look again at the text. She says at the end of verse 4, I did not know from where they came. We're going to see that's not the case. Furthermore, she's going to go on and say, verse 5, And it came about the gate was closed in darkness. Now, at night, but the emphasis at darkness. People can't see because of the darkness. And the men went forth. I did not, I do not know, literally, I didn't know where they went, these men went. Now, we're going to find this is not entirely true either. In fact, what we're going to learn is it was really after the fact that this came about. When she's saying this, she has preserved them. This is the implication of the text. Move to to the next verse, or actually the second part of verse 5. She says, pursue quickly after them, for you will overtake them, that you will obtain them, you will capture them. Now, what had she done? What she's saying is entirely right. Why? Because she took them up upon the roof. And she had hid them. Now, when did she hid them? Prior to these these servants of the king coming. She had hid them. Where? In the flax. Now, this is a, a plant. And there's, there's stems, or we could even call branches. They're very thin, more like stems of plants rather than branches of trees. Where from flax you make you make linen. And apparently she had a whole bunch of this in the, the roof of hers. And she hid these two men underneath that. Now, it would have allowed them to easily breathe. It was very porous, this, this material, these, these uh, uh, pieces of plant. And she put them there. They had not fled. They had not done this. She had hid them from anyone else when these spies came. In the, the stalks of flax that were arranged by her for her upon the roof. And it says, look now to verse 7. The men, these servants of the king, they pursued after them the way of Jordan, meaning going towards the Jordan River by means of, and we have the word fords, and it's really the word for a passageway. Why? Well, the area around Jericho is a desert. It doesn't get much rain, but in the mountains, it can rain. And the rain will come down. It will flow off the mountains, the mountains of of Judah, around Jerusalem and other places. And, And this water will rush through. It will take some of the soil and it will make a passageway. And this is what the people these soldiers were doing. They were pursuing after these two men going towards the Jordan back to where they were on the other side of the Jordan in order to capture them this is what she had said but what really happened something entirely different now look at the last part of verse 7 it says the gate they closed after them these ones who were pursuing when they went forth the ones pursuing after them verse 8 it says in verse 8 they before they had lied down. She had gone up unto them upon the roof. And she had said to the men, I knew. Now, it's not I know, but it's in the past. Pay attention. What it's speaking about is something had happened. We'll talk about what that is in a moment. That caused her to have already arri- arrived at a conclusion i want to say that again something had happened we'll mention what that is in a moment the text is going to tell us it's not an opinion not an interpretation it's what the text says that caused her to arrive at a conclusion at a decision and what is that 
Well, what's going to be emphasized now is the revelation that she had received from God that caused her to decide something that was already decided by her. And this impacted how she behaved. Verse verse 8. And they, before they lied down, she had gone up unto them upon the roof. And she, now verse 9, she said to the men, I knew, she arrived at that conclusion, that the Lord has given to you, and here it means to your people, to the children of Israel, the land. Why? Why did she know that the Lord had given the land to them, to the children of Israel? For your fear had fallen upon us. Now, what she's saying is this. There was revelation to all the people, all the people of Jericho and perhaps even beyond that. And we'll see why in a moment and what that revelation specifically was. We don't have to be in doubt. We don't have to to conjure up things in our mind. The text tells us. And she says, your fear, what does that mean? The fact that God is at work with you, that you are his covenant people. That has intimidated us. That has impressed us. It has brought about a different mindset among the people, all the people, including her. But she was different. It produced a different one in her. Now, what is she referring to? Well, she says again, for the Lord God has given to you the land. Now, that is foundational. And that is something that is inherently related to the purposes of God. Don't believe an individual that tells you the Jewish people, because they are covenant breakers, the, the relationship between them and the land has been terminated. This is not the case. It may be for a moment set aside because of exile. That's happened in the past, but God always, always brings the Jewish people back to the land. Despite the desires of the world, the leaders of the world, and the inhabitants of the land, it always happens. Even in our days, it's taking place. Praise God for that. And she is wise enough to know it's not dependent upon you. It's dependent upon God. God has given to you the land. And it's been attested because your fear has fallen upon us for we find that all the inhabitants of the land, this is what's important, not just Jericho, but all the inhabitants of the land, this is the promised land. What's happened? They have have grown weak, fainted before you, meaning this. They have had no resolve to to fight now this is so important because historically when the enemy came jericho was first to go out to battle they had that intelligence they knew what was going on they saw a threat they wanted to respond immediately go out to the people don't let them come close don't let them take the land any portion of it defeat them at once but they weren't doing that here why we were told the fear of yours, meaning this, the people of God. Because you are in a covenantal relationship, and we're going to see in a moment, they understood what that covenant brought about. What is that? God's activity in their circumstances. Now, it's the same for all people. You don't have to be Jewish for this to be a reality. What's the reality? When you are in a covenantal relationship with God, that fact, And when you're moving for his purposes in obedience to his purpose, God is going to be actively involved in your circumstances, in your situation. This is what the text is is teaching. For, we could say, fainted, became weak, all the residents of the land before you. Verse 10. For we heard, and this is where it gets really important, we have heard. 
Now, faith comes by hearing. That's potential. That's how faith comes by hearing, but just because you hear doesn't mean you're going to have faith. It gives you the potential to exercise faith. Here's the difference. All the people of Jericho, and furthermore, all the people of the land, they heard, but they didn't respond faithfully. There's only one person who is this woman, this harlot woman. She, based upon revelation, she is having a great change take place with her. She is going to start thinking differently and start behaving differently. This is what we're going to see in a moment. Verse verse 10. For we have heard what the Lord, what did the Lord do? How he dried up the waters of the sea of reeds before you. Now, this is a portion of the Red Sea. So you can say, God, he caused the Red Sea to dry up in that one location, but it was at a location known as the place, the waters of the reeds, where the reeds were. So she says, we, we heard how the Lord had done that for you. When you came forth from Egypt, they heard about God's redemptive work and how God brought the children of Israel through this, this sea of reeds. How he had dried up the land miraculously. And furthermore, she says, And what you have done to the two kings of the Amorites, which is on the other side of the Jordan, what two kings? Sihon and Og. Two very strong kings on the other side. So we had heard what God had done over there. That report had made its way to us. And what's happened? All the people, because of this fear, they didn't move in faith. And when you do not respond to God's revelation in faith, it is going to paralyze you. It is going to position you for defeat rather than victory. So what you do with God's revelation and what you believe about God's revelation, God's revelation, and I'm speaking now specifically about the revelation of God in this book, it is always truth. It is always relevant. It is always for now. We don't look at Scripture and say, well, that was true then. No, it's true when? Always. And it's truth for who? All people. And it is pertinent when? always is as pertinent we need to understand that this is what she is attesting what she has decided the conclusion that she arrived to because of this revelation that was given to her so what you have done to the two kings the two amorite kings which are in the other side of the jordan to sihon that's the name of one and to og this the other one what you and here it says what you have, how you have destroyed them. Now, the word destroy is very important. We could use the word hashmada, destruction. But but this is, and I'll state the noun, this is the word cherem in the verb form. And the word cherem means to utterly dedicate, destroy, but dedicate everything to God to take nothing now there were times when israel went out to battle that they after the victory they were able to plunder to take from from the defeated ones but in conquering the land this was not the case they were told to utterly destroy to bring to a harem everything now why was that well other nations they would go out to battle And they did that because it could be very profitable. If you defeat the enemy, you take their stuff. You take their wives, you take their children, you take their possessions. You can benefit financially and in other ways as well. So wars were for the purpose of growing more strong, gathering more property, accumulating things, power, and enslaving at times others for your purposes. 
God was telling all the Canaanites, all the people, this is not how we function. This is not how my children function. They do things based upon my commandments. And to show you, they're going to behave very differently. They're not going to take any plunder, any spoils, any wealth from the enemy. They're going to dedicate it all to me. This is a testimony to God is. The God of Israel is different. The God of Israel is sovereign. The God of victory. The God of Israel provides victory, but the people want victory. And what's that victory? Obeying God, not profiting from it financially or in some other way. This is emphasized at the end of verse 10. Now look at verse 11. And we heard, and what was the outcome? His heart melted. Now, again, it's not hearts. His heart melted. Who's he referring to? The people. The people of Jericho, the people of Canaan. In one, in unity. They all experience the same thing. That's why we have to pay attention to whether something is plural or singular. There's revelation. There's there's truth in how it's written. So his heart, meaning all the people's heart, it melted. And it says, and could not get up any of the spirit among men of the men before you no man not one could could rally his spirit have the power in other words to oppose you why for the lord your god he is the god of heavens and is over all the earth below so god rules the heavens up above and the earth below this is what she concluded and it's a great conclusion now she just didn't know that that's wonderful but she allowed that truth to govern her life, to rule her life, to make life decisions. And again, we have to ask ourselves, what about me? I might say, I believe this. I know this to be true. I read this. Yes, it's fact. But does it change my life? Does it impact the decisions I make? For Rahav, it did. This is why she hid these two men, this is why she lied to the enemy. Because she wanted to participate in what God was doing. Now look at verse 12. And now swear please to me, meaning take an oath. She's saying, I have demonstrated my commitment to God. I've proved that in how I've dealt with you too. I believe that it's the God of Israel, your God, that is the Lord over heaven, up above, and earth below. She's accepted the God of Israel. And that fact changes her. And notice what she did. Here's wisdom. She says, and now at this moment, you swear to me in the Lord, Yud Hey Vav Hey, that sacred name. You take an oath, please, unto me in the Lord. For what I have done with you, what has she done? Chesed. That is, I have acted graciously to you. But it's the word chesed. It is a covenantal grace. She says, it's because of this covenantal grace. Wait a second. She is a Gentile. Makes no difference. That covenant of grace is for all people. All you have to do is respond to it in faith. You receive faith, the revelation of God. You say, I believe that. Then you can enter into this covenantal covenant of grace. She says, for I have done with you grace. And you shall do also you with my father's house, grace, and you shall give them to me, you shall give to me, excuse me, you shall give to me a sign of truth. Now, it's interesting. Here's this Gentile woman. She hears a report, and now she's 
speaking grace and truth. This is going to, next week, it's going to repeat itself to give us what we're learning now, help in understanding it. But she wants grace and truth. She's given grace. She wants a response, a gracious response back from God through the people of God. And she wants truth. Very important. What does she want? Well, she says, you know, you give to me a sign that's in regard to the future of my father's house verse 13 our last verse and you many bibles will say spare it's not the word spare it's the word you make life now we're seeing grace and truth and what she says next is you make life meaning you sustain you keep alive this is the outcome of grace and truth it gives life this is what's being taught to the reader She says to them as God's representative from the people of God, you're his covenant people. You give life to my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters and all which is to them. And you shall save our souls from death. Now, can you get any more? gospel connected than that through grace and the truth of god she wants to be made alive that's what she's saying that you make alive my father's house and everything related to it that's what she's asking so that what that you save you deliver our soul from what our soul from death This is what faith brings about. And this woman had such faith, and we're going to see how her request, how these two men responded. They are representative of the people of God who are God's representatives. You're going to see there's much revelation, much wisdom, much truth, and how the second part of this chapter is going to be revealed to us so that we can learn truth about the grace of God, that we can learn that God functions always according to his truth. And when we truthfully respond to the grace of God, we are going to see God go to work in sustaining life and to do so for eternally. This woman, as you may or may not remember, remember that she made her way into the genealogy of Messiah. It's so significant. This woman, she may have been a harlot, but when the fear of the children of Israel that she experienced, she encountered, her life was transformed forevermore such such that that Yeshua brought her, used her in his very genealogy, how he would leave heaven and enter into this world to bring about redemption all of these words grace sustaining life truth all of this is related to god's purpose for his people his kingdom his eternal purposes well i'll close with that until next week when we press on and complete god willing this second chapter in this awesome book known as joshua until then may god bless you shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week. May the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.